So welcome everybody and thank you for uh, putting more time into this set of sharings, which I hope um, will be really productive for everybody. Um, it's building on a, a whole series of work that the Healthy Soils, Healthy Food program has been um, doing, mostly over Zoom. Um, and uh, a couple of weeks ago, we heard from three groups. Uh, we heard from uh, Ferdinand at Bioji, um, uh, and Nelson in Zimbabwe, and uh, Josephine from Uganda. Thank you very much to the three of you for presenting last time. Um, and we're building on on sharing the experience from different organizations uh, across Africa with their experiences of trying to apply the principles of um, the, uh, uh, the Indian uh, community natural farming um, approach that we've been learning about. Um, so thank you very much for coming. I'm also just checking to see whether we've got and thank you for the Indian team for um, also, well, first of all, sharing their experience, um, but also listening in on these um, sharing backwards and forwards. What we intend to do is, is do a synthesis of all the four different uh, webinars that we've put together. Um, and we're going to synthesize that and then share that with the Indian team and then get a, a really good feedback from, from them on, uh, on what's happening in Africa. Um, and then we'll take it from there to see what happens next. Um, so thanks very much to the Indian team for listening in on that. Uh, just building on, on last time, I think we, we heard from three different organizations and in some ways there was quite a lot of agreement around what principles they found easy uh, and what they were struggling with. One of the things that came out as a, as a, bon as a plus, um, I th think most organizations are finding the diversity principle fairly easy to apply, um, diversity of planting. Uh, and uh, that obviously is, is helping uh, in terms of root zone um, diversity, as well as leaf diversity. Um, the other thing that was, coming through as, as, a, as a bonus was the integration of animals, which I think people are, are fairly um, are good at doing across different organizations. Mulching was a, was a, a problem in, for some organizations actually getting enough material to mulch with. Um, and so that would be something that we would take forward as a problem and we'll be listening out for that in these three sessions. And the other one was uh, tilling, minimum tilling or no tilling. Um, and that is also quite a problem. And, and, and um, uh, it is also recognized as a difficulty in India as well, in terms of trying to get farmers to, to adopt a minimum tillage and, and give up the plow. Um, it would be good in this session to be really specific um, because it's something that we, even in, in England, we have the same uh, minimum till, no till confusion. Um, for me, I would say minimum till is still, is, you can still be hoeing um, and scratching the surface in order to get rid of weeds. Um, it's actually inverting the soil that I would say was, was the tillage. So no till, min till, uh, I would still say hoeing fits within that regime, but that would be good to open up that discussion as well and be really specific about it. Um, so, I think after that, unless there's any other um, points that you want to make, John, about the last session? No, 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 Matt. I think let's go plunge in. <clears throat> okay, that's great. So, um, Sam, are you ready to um, present? You might need to unmute. And I think, John, are you going to share your screen? Sorry, I muted. I'm going to share the screen for uh, Rusid and yeah. the others if necessary. Okay. So, um, thanks, John. Uh, yeah. Uh, no. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, much. Sam. And, Welcome. Uh, the rest of the team. 
Thank you very much, uh, Matt, John, uh, and the rest of the team. As Ruth said, we are very grateful to be part of this sharing, but also we are very grateful to have attended uh, the sharing from Andhra Pradesh. So uh, I think uh, just my work today was just to, to say hello to you. And uh, I think we really have a lot of learning. I could actually say is that as Rusid as a training institution, as a center for health food, health, sorry, health food, we've been actually trying out and what we are presenting actually, we are learning it more, but also we are training to other farmers. So I'm going to, I request my colleague, Mr. Sabaduka, to take over from here and then be able to take us through our presentation. Have a good mm -hmm. listening. Thanks, Sam. And I would just remind the presentation, uh, the presenters, that we have about 15 minutes for each presentation. So, Sam, I notice there's a lot of slides here, so we'll have to scoot through these fairly fast. But anyway, let's see it. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, morning, everybody. Uh, that first slide says uh, what we are going to do, and uh, we are located in Lubanda village, Chiroku Parish, Busimbi Division, Mitiana District. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. John. Next slide, please. Sorry, I, I have gone to, so you've got the map now. It just takes a bit of time sometimes. Have you got the map? Yeah, we have the map, but oh, I think. Okay, okay. Not yet. You haven't got the map. But then when you look at the map, you can see the capital of Kampala. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe uh, Mr. Mr. Sevaduka is not really seeing the map, but I can see the map here. I think this is just showing where we are located in Mitiana. So can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, looking at uh, Rusid, we want actually to, to, to discuss what is RUCID? But I know everybody knows RUCID as an NGO, but also limited company by guarantee. And we offer community services, uh, but also we have a, a formal training, organic agriculture training college, but also we offer skilling to the young people, especially in food processing and value addition. Next slide, please. Uh, so the two principles, the two principles are most putting into practice uh, the polar crops, that is intercropping, but also integrating animal with uh, crops. They are integrating animals in their activities. The crops which actually are here, as you can see, we have a lot of crops, crops include banana, cassava, maize, coffee, jack beans, mango, and, but also the, the, the livestock is including cattle, pigs, uh, chicken, um, mainly. However, intensity, the intensity system management vary from farm to farm. Some farmers have a lot of crops intercropped, but some farmers have very little uh, integration. But you find actually uh, integration is widely spread here. Next, please. Next slide, please. It, the two principles uh, which actually people struggle with is the local seed. Yeah, I think people, the local seed actually is becoming a problem, but also looking at the, uh, looking at the minds of the people. Uh, they, they are now looking at exotic as good ones, but also another where they are str struggling with the farmers, especially with weeds you find people uh, have no longer want to, to use a lot of energy. So weeds is a, a struggle. So you find the learning 
which we actually have been getting, tries to answer some of these uh, struggles. Next slide. Next slide, please. Sorry. Uh... Mrs. Varuka, are you on? Yeah, I'm coming. Okay. Yes, please can you go there? Uh -huh. as, as a result of that training, I, I think, Rusid, we there is increased raising awareness among the community, farm and, and farmers. We are working with in relation to working with the nature way towards principles of natural farming. I, I, I think we are looking at this word natural farming. And so whatever we do now, all the communities we interpret with, we are really looking at the nature farming. As you are going to see below, you can see even as Rusid, but the farmers around us, we are trying to intensify uh, the relation between implementing principles and of natural farming. So if you could go on the, on the, on the photographs, you'll be able to see. Now, the principles which we have actually put into practice, about which we are, we, we are trying to tra train people, uh, cover crop. And there is this new, new, tech, new word. We are talking about uh, 365 days green cover. When you look at our way of working, we are actually going to, we are talking almost 70% about green cover. We are also looking at the polycrop management. And this is still having a challenge because as we say, we don't know when and how to plant the real cropping is still a challenge. No other TH uh, practices also. Uh, yeah, I, I think as Matt was saying, we are looking at what is really low tillage. For example, we are looking at hand, hand weeding. Is that not tillage? We are looking at hand hole using. We are using at mulching. So we are there. Interpreting of animals, yeah, I think we are intensifying it because sometimes you find animals actually destroying crops. And that's not a good, a good way of interpreting crops in animals. Then we are also intensifying the solid application of solid biostimulant. And we are farmers to be able to manage. Though it's good, but I think uh, the first management we are doing it. For example, when you come to the city here, you find uh, you can look for for pests and you not see them. Uh, but then uh, when you look at no chemical stress, I think uh, uh, the principle which we are really looking at very critically here, we are trying to see that we do a lot of work as far as no chemical stress. When we come to cover crop, so if you go, this is actually what is happening. It, it is since the training, if you look at them, then there are new fields which we have developed in our training guides showing a variety of crops. And this is it's really amazing. Even at this time when we are in the dry season, these gardens are very green. Next, please. Please, next slide. Yeah, it's in these gardens, you can see the crop. Yeah. Then, you already have a crop. We are using mukuna, but you see the challenge with the mukuna, you really need to be getting it from, from climbing. And but still, you find even if it is, it's really uh, climbing, but it, it is making uh, the cover crop intensive in our activities. Next, please. Next photo. Next photo, John. Yeah, yeah, it's coming. It just takes sometimes a pause. Yes. Uh, all this, you can see how we are intensifying. Look at this new crop. I think um, uh, we here we are terming it as Andhra Pradesh um, garden. 
banana, sugarcane, sorghum, tephrosia, hungary, coffee, maize, mukuna, and they, they actually working together. And really something amazing. Uh, when you, you look at it, you really uh, see even the farmers now, whoever comes, whoever lands is really, what is the interesting that this system whereby we are actually trying to have green cover, there is continuous harvesting of crops. As one crop goes out, another crop goes in. So it, it is something which is actually showing, it's not only practice, but also increases in the uh, uh, productivity of that area. Please next. Next slide. Yeah, all, all now you already see the, 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 the intercropping in progress. Intercropping in progress uh, as a, a principle which actually has taken root. But what, what is really also interest, interesting, this intercropping brings the cover, soil cover, and find soil cover. We no longer have to ferry dry materials but the green materials actually do cover the soil and that makes the soil to be always green. You already see we are trying to take care of farmers to the, uh, to, to the fields. So now we are intensifying. Once what we did was to establish these um, trials and then, so we go to the notillage. So the photographs which you are going to be seeing show how we are trying to stop to, to minimize tillage. So these photographs, as I said, we are just showing the no tillage. Weeding is done only when needed, but also selective cover crop becomes very, very critical. So what you see here, no tillage. When you, when you look on, 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 your, on the photographs on your right, you see that banana plantation. That banana, the, the banana which you see there, there is no weeding going on. And what you have actually found, no tillage makes the crop to use its the natural uh, fertility. And we find the bananas which are under no tillage, they are doing much, much better in terms of size, but also in terms of pests. There are no pests there. So you already see here we are looking at no tillage, the, uh, but this is achieved through uh, planting a variety of crops. So you can really see the 365 green cover also offers the benefit of nature. Integrating of animals. Uh, so we, as we said, we have this integrating of animals. We are not only integrating uh, animals like goats, but also the bees. The bees, when you see this is one uh, in one of, uh, of our contact farmers, the coffee is doing very well. So the pollination is being done by the bees. The goats, you already, what is, we don't understand. It seems goat manure, I don't know whether that's true. We have to, to, to research on it. Goat manure is even doing much better than the cattle manure. So we are integrating, having the same zero, uh, uh, yeah. Already, you see, we have different systems of integrating animals. We have poultry, which is semi-intensive, uh, semi, uh, semi -intensive, but also we have, uh, when you, you look on the right, we have cattle, uh, goats, and poultry staying together. So they are now benefiting one another. Organic matter addition. When we come to organic matter addition, the photos which you are going to see, they are, so you already see we have this is a recycling of cast husks into vermicompost. So vermicompost is because we find when the earthworms are doing the work for us, they are turning common coffee husks into a very, very fertile. But what is also very, very critical is the liquid from the mummy compost, which is a very good fertilizer, but at the same time, it is a, a very good in repairing pests. And therefore, once we use it, we have both of them. So 
uh, recycling is very, very critical. Apart from cover crops, but also all the organic matter which we get, we recycle. In addition to our bokashi, which uh, maybe you can continue this next slide, and you see that we are also continuing. So these ones are compost, compost heaps, which are actually, uh, uh, no, no, this is mulching. But I think I want to talk about bokashi. So you already see mulching after planting. This, when we mulch with the dry matter, the mulch goes into the ground. Um, you already see uh, the mulch. In, and see, there is, it has been really very interesting. The crops we are still doing very, very well. So can we continue, please? So all this we are trying to we are we are trying to show uh, how we mulch, for example. For the turmeric plant, we, to do it well, we have to, to mulch it, to mulch it, and add it. It's really doing very well. Next slide, please. Next slide, John. Yes, coming. Yeah, well, this is a continuation of mulching using different, different materials. Yeah. So please continue. Pest management. Now, as I said, though, though we have a challenge, uh, people say that is, I could even say it's not a challenge. When we use the biostimulants, you find that mainly the, 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 the pests disappear. Sometimes you already look at these crops, they don't have any pest. So by adding, by improving soil fertility, we don't struggle with the pest. As people want to really get these uh, pest, even if they are biological, for us we don't mind because the soil is so good. And we really believe that once you feed the soil, once you give the soil, then we look at these crops, it's dry season, but the intercropping, those methods which you have been actually talking about, but also we are planting other crops. For example, we have a lot of tephrosia, uh, which is uh, which is a very good uh, uh, pest control plant. We also have um, uh, uh, we have marigold. Uh, this these are tagaitas and others. So maybe you can continue and see how the methods which are using up are actually trying to make sure that our gardens are free from pests. The integration, those crops actually will repair, will confuse the pests. So here we, uh, we have been doing a lot of uh, evaluation and trying to look at what is actually happening, what is really interesting. Uh, in many places, you find mushrooms growing. When you see the mushroom growing, this is a that is becoming really healthy. And so local seed, I talked about it in my presentation. We have established um, um, a seed bank. This seed bank is really in, in, in collaboration with Pelham Uganda, but so uh, we have we are doing a lot of uh, seed, uh, multiplication, but also promotion of seed. So, five, what we saw in the nine principles of uh, in the Andhra Pradesh system. And we have the time zone. Can we go to the next slide, please? So local seed, as I said, we have the local maize, which we are multiplying. Um, uh, already this bean, these genus where you see me, you can see this is Nyanzi holding a local variety of groundnuts. This was during a dry season and we had to water the groundnuts in order to get them. But it was really amazing. You can see how they are yielding. So we are trying to promote by growing, but also by uh, supplying it to the farmers. Challenges, um, I think the challenges here is research. I think many of what we are doing, we really need research to be conducted. 
Uh, but, but, but also, um, when you look at the, the government, as you see, people are still not, re they are not discouraging actually, but okay, maybe they are discouraging. They, they think that they increased uh, the, the, the high value, what I mean, the hybrid are better, but also consumer awareness, uh, promotion of local varieties, but also marketing of local varieties. These are some of the challenges as far as seed are concerned. Um, maybe we can uh, continue uh, a bit further. Principles still challenging. Application of liquid biostimulants we have not actually done. Yeah, yeah, we are starting, but not much. As I said, it, low tillage, no tillage. Still, yeah, we, we want to come up with, with a field definition, but also the choice of, of which crop to plant together, but also the leading. How do we, for example, because we want these crops to be able to produce, we want the crops to be actually be productive. How do we plan the planting? But also some cover crops are aggressive. As a result of the uh, under um, uh, session, I think, we are going to do the scaling. Uh, and, and I think when you have another sharing, you'll be able to see things in the, uh, those, uh, those, uh, uh, those technologies on um, a larger scale. But uh, we want to look at the benefits and what have you. Then uh, assess the economic viability as per unit area involving uh, the, the, the farmers. So I think I want to thank everybody for giving us the opportunity to share what we are doing, but also I want to thank the Andhra Pradesh and thank you very much. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> that was a lot of information packed into a very short time. So thank you very much. And I'm just looking at the comments. Uh, there's been a request to translate the PowerPoint. And it's something that we will have to um, think about. I, I think we should provide PowerPoints uh, in two languages. It's just getting the logistics right. Um, but I think, Sam, that gives you an indication of people's interest in, in the work that you've been describing. Uh, it's a fantastic resource for other people to use as a PowerPoint. So I think we should try and make a point of um, of having them in, in French as well as in English. Um, I'm, I'm going to maybe take a couple of questions from the, the box, but I also wanted to make the point of, uh, I know where the presentations we're trying to fit a lot in, but we also, uh, we need to go fairly slowly in order for Ludo to, to translate. <laughs> so um, we have to uh, just bear in mind the, the translation speed as well. Um, so um, Sam, could you just very, very briefly, like in 20 seconds, just explain your, um, uh, your season um, and uh, the, um, the, your agroecological agro zone and climate, just so that people can identify where you're at? Yeah, we are in the tropical, I would say tropical rain, rainfall, not rainforest, but I think it should be uh, because we are near the lake. We have two seasons. The first season, oh, the, the two rain seasons. The first rain season starts in March uh, to June, and another one starts in September to December. So those two seasons we have rain and i think we have quite a lot of rain it's, it's over two two thousand millimeters of rain uh, 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 yeah that's what our, our annual rainfall so uh, we are along the equator actually but due to climate change today you find yeah how the sun becomes very for example now we are in the middle of the dry season thank so you so i think that's uh yeah. That's great. And Sam, you can see the questions in the chat box. Um, so it would be good um, if, if you have time to get back to people um, with the, to answer their questions, if that's possible. I'm going to also just bring in another quick question. Um, uh, so 
uh, David is asking, what crops do you use in the push pool? In the push pool, we use uh, nepia grass um, uh, and, and maize. Nepia grass, that's elephant grass. So uh, the, the, the nepia grass and maize, you find these have uh, some sort of, um, uh, I don't know, uh, yeah, people know that those uh, pheromones, which actually push the pests, uh, for example, uh, the, the, the nepia will pull, will pull the pests from the maize and you find the pests tend to really go towards the maize, uh, the part of the nepia grass, and you find the, your, your, your maize is really very good. But also we are, we, we are using quite a lot of cowpeas, cowpeas for trying to push the, uh, the, 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 uh, Ameworm, because they, they don't, they don't they, when there is the, the cowpeas, then the ameworm will be pushed and they will not come near to the, to the maize. So basically we are using maize and um, nepia grass, also legumes. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so I, there's, as you can see, there's lots of questions coming through. And um, I think part of the idea behind this approach is that you all know each other and you know each other's email addresses. Um, so the more you get to learn about each other's work, hopefully um, the more that communication just happens naturally between organizations. We can facilitate some of that, but obviously we have a time constraint this morning. So I'm going to thank you very much to Sam and your team, Elijah, everybody. Um, uh, I think the work that you're doing at Rusit is really, really impressive and it comes across on the PowerPoint very well. But now I'm going to move on to uh, OAC uh, and Evelyn. I'm hoping that you're ready to unmute and introduce OAC. Perhaps you could also just talk again about your climactic zone before you start your presentation. And I think John is going to do the screen sharing. So I'm just checking, Evelyn. Would you like me to screen share to do the screen share, and you tell me when to get onto the next slide? No, I'll share on my own. Okay. Ah, no, no. Evelyn is on it. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Evelyn, standing in for OAC. OAC in full is Organic Agriculture Center of Kenya, which is found in Kenya, in the central part of Kenya. OAC started its operation back in the year 2006, and we are, we are dealing with tea and coffee farmers training them on organic farming. I'm very happy this afternoon to share about OAC's experience in natural farming as from last year. So OAC's vision is, it envisions independent communities participating in sustainable, economic, ecological and social well-being of people. And OAC's mission is committed to strengthening the nutrition security, health livelihoods, and sustainability of farmers through promoting ecological farming. According to the principles which were taught us from last year to early this year, we found that the principle that we are implementing fully, we find it working for us is integration of animals in farming. We do emphasize on that, on integration of small stocks like goats, poultry, and rabbits. This is because they provide manure for farming and also for composting, and also urine for preparation of biofertilizers, and at the same time providing ex extra income from their product sales, like goat milk, and eggs, and even meat. It also provides nutri nutrition diversity for farmers. This is because we chose on small stock because we deal with, with small scale farmers who don't have space to integrate large animals. The next principle we are implementing is use of biofertilizers. Apart from composting, which we do introduce during the start of training, 
We also do Bokashi, cow part pit, that is CPP. Maybe the Indians understand this more. Then you have the fermented liquid by fertilizers, fermented liquid by pesticides. We have lactic acid bacteria, supermagro, ash brew, a peach, natural solid microbes, lime sulfur brew, horn manure, also known as P500, and horn silica, P501. <laughs> Integration of bisphenol and self in avoiding the use of chemical and herbicides in farms. That is under principle number nine. As most of the herbs and weeds are used in by fertilizer and compost preparations. Weeding is also largely embraced as the remains are used in mulching and composting in the farms, which aids in organic matter addition in the soil. CPP and P500 are as use, used as seed inoculants and soaking the seedlings before planting. That slide, you can see the photos of, of activities, you can see composting and bokashi making with different farmers. You can see ready cured compost, covered compost, compost that is in the process being made and also bokashi in progress. The principle we, find, we found out that we are struggling is with is low or no or low tillage. It is because most of the farmers we deal with come from the lower side of Abadeas, which is, experiences a lot of rainfall, which makes weeds overgrow very fast, therefore competing with crops for nutrients. At the same time, farmers also believe that they must steal their lands after every season. This is because they believe that when they don't see their lands, it will develop hard pan, and this will hinder crops' root penetration. And at the end of, the, of it all, they will not have food on their table. So we also found out that we are struggling with crop diversity. And this is because farmers we work with the small scale farmers who own small pieces of land. And at the same time, those small pieces of land are occupied with tea or coffee. So this makes it difficult for them to have more than eight to 12 varieties of crops on the same piece of land. Maybe on that, which we're implementing under crop diversity is maybe just intercropping. Like we, can inter we do intercrop maize and beans. Yeah, something we are doing uh, differently is local seeds. We are encouraging on seed saving and exchange among farmers. You can see there a photo there with a farmer preparing his own seed that his own homestead. homestead. We also have a program on seed banking, one within the office and others with farmers in the field. We provide farmers with, with glass jars for storing their seeds safely. We also correct the traditional and often seeds and preserve them as well as multiply them for regener regeneration. We encourage farmers to also continue the traditional orphan crops for nutrition diversification. That slide just shows different varieties of seeds at farmer level and at our OAC office. Thank you. Evelyn, that was fantastic. Uh, very, very interesting. And um, particularly what's striking is that your variety of biostimulants that you're using. I know that OAC has always been at, uh, one of the people at the forefront of this, but it's, it's really nice to see the range of biostimulants that you're using. And, and also to, to see your um, the way that you are uh, uh, identifying where you're struggling with the principles and also where you're doing really well. So um, that's that's great. Perhaps Evelyn, could you could just um, uh, 
uh, just explain the, the rainfall in your area and the, the rainy season. Yes, I have a colleague with me here. He can tell you. The rainfall that we experience in this region, it's about 2,000 millimeters per year. Great, thank you. So I, I understand that um, there are people listening from very many different uh, climactic zones. <laughs> and, um, and I can imagine people who are in dry zones looking at these presentations and, and wondering how, you know, how they're relevant. And I guess um, we need to make sure that we have a wide variety of presentations from different zones and hope that you can draw some principles from all the presentations. So um, it's quite an ambitious program to try and combine so many different regions. Um, are there any questions for Evelyn arising from her presentations? Uh, there's one here uh, from Myra saying, uh, what are the other benefits of these practices besides preserving the natural resources? Evelyn, do you want to come back on that one? Reducing the cost of production is one of the benefits. And in terms of uh, nutrition and diet, Evelyn, do you think, do you see any change in uh, uh, the people that you're working with in terms of their diet and their, their nutrition? Yes, in terms of nutrition, the people you work with, they have improved health as some of those crops hence in improving the immunity and suppressing some of the diseases that are occurring from lifestyle diseases and what we are eating from the modern production. Thank you. And you can see the yes. comments. Um, there's a request from Nelson um, for pamphlets on the biofertilizers. I think it would be really interesting at some stage, we, we've got material on the biofertilizers, both from uh, the original work that Juan Fran and Jairo did uh, when they toured around various different countries in Africa about five years ago. We also have material from uh, organizations like Biogi. Uh, and we then, of course, we have the material from the AP team in India, the, the community natural farming team in India. Um, but it would be great to build on that body of material and have OAC, for instance, being able to put their, their biofertilizer recipes into a sort of a resource pack that people can access, maybe as a hard copy or, or online. So that's something that we'll have a look at taking that forward. I think that'd be a, a good idea. Um, Hi, Matt? Yeah. yeah, John, go ahead. There's another question that, that I think is quite an interesting one. Uh, it's from Peter. I'm amazed at the number of biostimulants. Are they all used or how do farmers decide which to use? So for me, that's an interesting question because I think what they've done in Andhra Pradesh is they've identified two or three biostimulants, which they find work. And this helps farmers. So farmers don't have a huge choice to choose from. And, and so I would be interested to hear from uh, either Evelyn or, or Duncan uh, at OAC. How do you help farmers in, in choice? Uh, do you help them, especially when they're coming new to it? Is, is it not a bit overpowering all these different things to choose from? Uh, to, to me, that's a very interesting question. Could you respond? At the work, we teach them on different biostimulants and they make choices on what to use depending on the problem that they want to solve. Some of them are biostimulants, some will work as some will work as polyabatritas, fertilizers, others as pesticides. So they make the choice depending on the club and what they want to do with their clubs and achievements. Thanks. And do you find, Duncan, that there are particular ones that are used much more often than others? Or do you find that they're all pretty much used as the same tools in the kit? 
FPE is more preferred by farmers, that is fermented plant extracts, because it's easy to make. While we have some few farmers who made or mix enough of them and they choose on what is performing better on a specific crop. Great. Okay, thank you. And Ferdinand, you jump in with your question, please. Yes, it's just a compliment uh, uh, on that interesting question uh, on how do you help farmers choose. I would uh, say we actually, when doing the trials, um, farmers have some immediate need. There, most of the farmers we work with and those I observe in the better part of Kenya is the, just the soil fertility, that the fertility of the soil is very low. And that when you do a trial on one uh, recipe and that seems to succeed, then uh, the details and the observations and the information around it uh, becomes very attractive. And th that's how they pick. Yeah, and for those who have a problem with the pests, they would directly go on um, alternatives to do with the pests. But our observation is that when we start with the soil, you, you even address the pest uh, uh, problem so that they are complementary. Thank you. Thanks, Ferdinand. Uh, and then one last question before we move on. Um, in terms of income, is there a significant difference between your partners and those not yet involved in your farming system? You are still on mute, and maybe either Duncan or Evelyn could answer. No, they're just adding up the figures to see which. <laughs> <laughs> Evelyn, Duncan, uh, you're on mute. I don't know whether you can respond to that question. Oh, no, maybe we've lost them. Anyway, let's move on. Um, I think just. Matt, yep. just I know their area quite well. Uh, yeah. And I think one of the big things that they've done, someone asked a question about uh, nutrition, it's kind of ironical, but Abadez is a, is a high potential area. But because of the monocropping of tea, uh, uh, malnutrition rates are quite high in terms of, of Kenya, one of the highest rates. Uh, so one of their big focus has been to improve health by diversity of plants. Uh, so it's tea is the main income in the area and coffee lower down. So I, I think I haven't answered that directly because I don't know about the income, but the, the main emphasis has been around trying to improve people's health because of the high malnutrition rates. Yeah. Thanks, John. Uh, and, and thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure whether we've still got them on the call. I think maybe there's a connection problem, but thank you very much to, to Duncan and Evelyn uh, for that presentation. Um, and I'm going to move on now to uh, Jessica, if, if I can. Um, uh, Jessica, are you able to unmute and are you wanting to share your screen or would you want John to, to do a screen share from where he is? Thank you, Matt. Uh, I think I can share my screen. Okay, thanks, okay. Jessica. Yes. So uh, uh, if you could just start with your uh, your rainfall and your climate zone as well. It seems to be um, a useful thing to have at the beginning of the presentation. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, hey, thank you, Mant, once again. Uh, and thank you, everyone else. Uh, in terms of, uh, I start by, my name is Jessica. Uh, I work for SCOPE, uh, which is the Schools and Colleges Pemakacha, Malawi. So in a case of uh, rainfall pattern for Malawi, I think uh, we, uh, our climate is more specifically tropical climate. It is more about subtropical. Uh, we receive in terms of uh, different types of seasons. Uh, we have the hot and the rainy seasons, which starts from mid-November to April. Uh, from following that, we have a cool and a dry season, I think, which starts about after April, from May to uh, should be about maybe August. Uh, and then we have uh, the driest seasons, which uh, start from uh, August end to uh, mid-November. 
Uh, in terms of uh, rainfall pattern, I think we receive about an average of uh, about 700 to, 700 to uh, 2,000 millimeter of rainfall, depending on areas uh, in the southern region and the central region, as well as in the northern region. So in the southern region, they receive quite a number of uh, rainfall compared to uh, the rest of the region. So, so I'll go straight to my presentation. Uh, yeah, so I'll take you through uh, the introduction, uh, a bit of introduction of scope for uh, uh, the natural farming principles that we are promoting and the principles that we are struggling with and uh, what we are doing differently as well as uh, way forward. Yeah, so by looking at uh, uh, this slide, uh, you can see the uh, two pictures, uh, the one on the left and the one on the right. This is what we are, uh, we are trying to do in schools as well as communities. So a typical schools uh, or a typical household in, uh, in Malawian setting, uh, more especially in rural areas where there are our areas that we work, uh, work for, uh, that typically bare grounds as you can see. So we try to at least the, uh, uh, change or transform this bare land to something uh, uh, productive. So yeah, so as you can see the picture, this is more like one of the typical schools that we are working out. Yeah, so in terms of our uh, uh, working uh, areas, so we operate in uh, 12 districts in Malawi, in central northern region, as well as southern region. Uh, we work with the other like-minded partners which uh, also do the same similar work about agriculture and agroecology. So uh, currently we have managed to train about 47 communities. Uh, at each of the communities, we have uh, selected 10 households which uh, uh, acts as role model households at, this, at the school. So in total, we we'll say seven, about 470 households have been uh, uh, trained. So we have managed to establish uh, about uh, two permaculture clubs, uh, as well as teaching over 200 teachers. This is uh, basically what we do. Uh, coming up to the best practice principles that we are doing, uh, number one is uh, uh, crop diversity. So in terms of crop diversity, what we are looking for, we are looking at uh, planting and care for six varieties of legumes. This they can be crops as well as fixing trees. Uh, the crops it might be uh, the, the beans, the groundiness, the pigeon peas, the bambaranas, or even the cow peas. We also try to promote uh, the trees, which are the leguminous trees, the glycidias, the lecuna, acacia. Uh, in number two point was about, is about planting and care for at least uh, five traditional varieties of, uh, of food plants. So we look at the uh, traditional food. Uh, there might be maize, sorghum, millet, millet, the pear millet, as well as the finger millet. So this uh, this uh, principle looks much on, uh, uh, is also trying to work at what we are trying to promote in our, our schools as well as communities. So if you look at uh, the, the likes of food trees intercropping system, at least 50% of the planted area. This is basically what we are trying to promote in terms of our crop diversity. Moving forward, uh, these are some of the pictures showing uh, uh, showing what we are uh, trying to say in terms of uh, the crop diversity principle, like I mentioned earlier. So this, the, the previous picture was more of a household uh, farm and the, the other pic two pictures was more of a a school example of what we are trying to promote in terms of the crop diversity. Moving forward to the next principle, which is uh, our local seeds. We also promote local seeds. Uh, in here, we are looking at planting and care for at least five traditional varieties of food plants. Um, in terms of uh, the traditional varieties, there are so many uh, traditional varieties that we promote talk about uh, amaranthas, pumpkin, okra, sorghum, millet, bambaranas, or even maize. 
We also try to introduce forgotten crops or lost diversity in the uh, community. So normally, uh, due to the terms, uh, as well as due to the introduction of the hybrid seeds and the like, some of the uh, indigenous uh, crops or indigenous foods have been lost or have been neglected. So we try to bring back the lost diversity. We also try to do seed multiplication and saving. So this is part of trying to promote the principle, which is now the local seeds or the traditional seeds. So the following slides picks or shows some of the seeds that we are promoting. The left uh, pictures you can see is uh, uh, one of the, the picture taken in one of the seed fairs that we uh, normally organize. And the right uh, picture is showing a food visit that we normally conduct in, uh, uh, when we're inspecting our farms. This is more of uh, a permeate farm of one uh, 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 farmer that we are working with. So uh, in terms of the principles most struggling with, so the number one principle is the no chemical uh, stress or avoid all chemical pesticides, herbicides, as well as fertilizer. We are finding it difficult in, uh, to at least promote this one in terms of, uh, because of the uh, situation of input subsidy programs, which have been uh, facilitated in, in, in Malawi. So there is always this, uh, a kind of dependency uh, syndrome, which the farmers are actually having because of this input subsidy programs. So normally farmers, uh, they don't have this innovative mind uh, in terms of trying to diversify their uh, 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 land, in terms of having a mindset on uh, receiving, get just being on the receiving end because of this promotion. So at the end of the day, it becomes difficult to actually uh, 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 show farmers to uh, change their mindset. So we experience a bit of resistance when it comes to no chemical stress principle. Uh, principle number two, which we are uh, finding it difficult is about uh, no or low tillage. Uh, this principle, farm, farmers are finding it difficult to change the conventional way of doing things where we are looking at uh, uh, they have been taught or they have been used to at least make ridges when they are, they are, they are, they are, they are trying to plow every time, time and again every season. So this, I think, is caused much on the, uh, that has been caused much on uh, intensive use of the chemicals which has compacted the soil uh, to some extent, whereby it is, they are finding it difficult to just uh, leave it uh, their the, the, the farms without uh, uh, disturbance at all. So I think it, it goes back to what you was to, uh, was explained earlier on to say, how do we dis, de, de, define what is tillage, to what extent are we, are we talking about tillage? Yeah, so on what we are doing differently, uh, we have about two uh, principles which we feel that we are now trying to do it differently. The use of biostimulants, uh, as well as the no chemical stress. So, what we have managed to do for the past two years is to actually integrate our trainings with the biofertilizers. So, in this case, we are uh, promoting more on the Bokashi. So, in terms of the pesticide, uh, pesticides, we are also intensifying much on the use of the biopaste, the RPG, the ashy brew, as well as the SAFA brew. Now, following the uh, Andhra Pradesh community natural uh, farming uh, uh, sessions that we've had, uh, we have also started uh, incorporating or doing seed coating in our seeds. So, which was not previous the case. Now we are uh, promoting this almost to all our farmers to say at least uh, try to uh, do the seed coating following the, uh, the, the Andhra Pradesh uh, uh, community uh, natural farming uh, uh, series. So, oh, my slides, where are they? Yeah, so these are the, uh, some of the pictures that are showing. As you can see, this is a picture of uh, one training that we conducted on seed coating. So we're teaching our farmers on uh, how to coat seeds using ash and molasses. Uh, 
uh, the the three the two pictures here that are showing the uh, trainings that we organized when we are doing the Apichi as well as the uh, Safa Brew. Uh, for Bokashi in the communities, uh, these are the pictures. Uh, the one of, uh, in our left is the, uh, one of the schools that we have our uh, learners uh, teaching uh, themselves as well as the teaching uh, teachers on how to make Bokashi. And the one to the uh, right is one of the communities that we uh, conducted the trainings. Yeah, so in terms of the way forward, now looking at all the nine principles, we feel that we hardly had time to actually engage more of our community members to actually go through all the nine principles. So SCOPE has a, a piece of land which we are trying to demonstrate some of the things that we are doing. We have dedicated a piece of land that we feel that we should also demonstrate almost all these principles where our farmers can come and see to say we can be able to uh, grow uh, crops throughout the year without uh, depending on uh, rainfall. Having reached here uh, that far, I would say thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. That's, that's another fantastic presentation. I've got to say the quality of the presentations are uh, really, really impressive. And so uh, we will we will get them translated uh, and we'll have them as a resource going forward. Um, because they're, they're also just, they're very good teaching um, resources uh, as well. So uh, thank you very, very much for that. And it's another whole interpretation of, of your particular situation. The thing that strikes me from what you're saying is uh, some of the things that are holding back the adoption of this are, are actually sort of perverse subsidies or, yes. um, and, and in the case of Kenya as well, the seed laws. So there, there's actually policy uh, breaks on this that, that are imposed at, from the outside that are actually hindering adoption of this as well as as well as cultural and and um, the, the practice of local farmers so that's a really interesting dimension um, I'm also looking down the 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 um, the comments box and looking for questions if people have a question um, perhaps you could take the screen sharing off Jazika and then I can see if any hands are going up at all. Um, so um, thank you very, very much for that presentation. Um, and one question coming in uh, <laughs> from Samba, how do you deal with the school time and your training time? So, I mean, it may be an opportunity just to speak for like two, one or two minutes about the approach of scope and how you integrate the, the, the approach into the school timetable. Yes, uh, thank you for uh, the question. I think, uh, so normally what we do is uh, uh, we work hand in hand with the Ministry of Education through the Department of the School Health and Nutrition. So uh, whatever uh, we operate normally to the school calendar. So our uh, trainings are usually done outside the school uh, uh, holidays. Uh, so normally when the calendar, the government uh, 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 provides or uh, makes the calendar at the end of the day, we uh, usually incorporate all our trainings in within uh, the school's calendar. So activities at the school, they are part of the extracurriculum activities which usually are conducted in schools. So in terms of our approach to schools, what we usually do is our schools uh, are usually the focal point where we can say our entry point. So when we identify the schools, we actually engage all the stakeholders involved, including the uh, uh, the, the, the payers, uh, the uh, teachers, the community leaders, all the stakeholders surrounding the school, the mother group, as well as the school management committees. So when all these uh, stakeholders are, are involved, so we actually do a mapping exercise whereby we map out 
the needs necessarily or what is it that we want, what is it that we want to achieve at the end of the day. Because each school is different and each school has its own needs. So with this needs assessment, they uh, uh, try to bring out to say what is it that we want to achieve in the next two to five years at the end of the day. So there is no, in terms of uh, 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 disturbance of the school calendars, as well as all these activities that are done at the school, because normally we operate outside the uh, uh, school sessions. That's great, thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I, this is also a chance for us to step back from the three presentations, uh, even you know, go dive back into the original three presentations, uh, and just try and draw out themes um, that that we can see our causes for celebration, causes for concern, how we scale things up. Um, the, the idea of actually trying to relocate an idea from Andhra Pradesh across Africa is of course ambitious and 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 may and and you know it's it's not going to be very straightforward. That doesn't that doesn't normally happen. So it, this process is about very gently and very carefully seeing what principles could be applied. Uh, where, where the weak points might be in translation uh, and to just go at it very slowly and, and see what's appropriate. So this is a chance to sort of discuss some of those uh, issues coming up. Ferdinand. Yes, I think it's uh, uh, interesting to uh, listen to what uh, Scope is also doing and um, just trying to join what we are also uh, thinking moving forward. Uh, especially uh, doing the trials. I think this, uh, uh, most of the learning has been uh, new and integrating this with um, the biofertilizers. I think that would uh, prov provide a lot of um, new, some insights and other uh, learning and more innovations and see how farmers react uh, when they practically uh, see how things are happening. So I think that's, um, uh, an interesting area just to try and uh, move forward with trials trying to do uh, and 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 relating to what was uh, uh, taught uh, during those uh, uh, series i think that's a very very interesting area we need to really keep uh, uh, being more proactive thank you thanks ferdinand and that's reflected a bit in the comments in the chat box uh to to really get some idea about uh what trials are being run and what what uh, evaluation is being done. I know that the natural um, community farming organization in Andhra Pradesh are very good at uh, monitoring what's going on and, and feeding in results. And I think that's something we could try, try and really encourage. Uh, Peter, you have a question. Yes, thank you. Um, in terms of it's just sort of reflections on all the presentations, those of today, which were, I agree were excellent. Um, one comment is that, as you've mentioned, Matt, the, the application of the principles is not always that straightforward depending on where you are. If you have two rainy seasons and 2,000 <laughs> millimeters of water, um, that's different than when you're in a dry zone where you have uh, 500 or 700 and only one short rainy season and even most of the rain falls in one month. So I think that there are certain challenges that um, we, you know, we need to look at adaptation of, um, of those principles to different agroecological zones and regions. So you've already made that point, but I just wanna emphasize it. So that is why we are learning from each other as well. And I hope that we can have some more dry season oriented uh, presentations soon. The second point is that I'm not sure, I have to look at my nine principles, but I thought that 365 day a year cover doesn't seem to have been mentioned that much. And to me, that is really quite important not to leave the ground bare, but how to do that. And again, that would vary quite a bit between one zone and the other. Um, and so I, I like to learn more, more about the way that that can be done 
uh, maybe from some of the presenters. Uh, one person mentioned that they had 70% of the time ground covered. And even that's in a dual rainy season zone. So that would be something to, uh, to discuss more. And then the final thing is that uh, I, I get the sense that maybe I'm wrong, but that there was quite a bit of, um, I don't know, let me put it in a positive way. Andhra Pradesh, the uh, community natural farming, their major strength is that they have spread it to not thousands of farmers, not 10,000s of farmers, but I mean, really, you know, um, millions, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And that we are still very much at trial stage, but that, um, you know, we also need to look at the scaling. How do we get from a couple of villages, 400 families to 4,000 to 40,000? And we need to look at those methods as well. And uh, how do we, you know, spread out farmer to farmer so that, although we are still learning, we still need to address that. Thanks, Peter. Um, oh, I've lost him. No, he's <laughs> I think this, this, I think in terms of the spread, I agree that um, what, what's happening in Andhra Pradesh is phenomenal in terms of adoption. But I also think it's quite interesting bringing together organizations across Africa who are working with considerable numbers of farmers. And if you actually put everybody uh, together and, and we have a, a basically quite similar approach, um, I think you would also get quite an impressive impact. It's just, it's, it's really important uh, to identify each other and to network in this way so that we can really share each other's ideas and thoughts and, uh, and also see the, the overall impact of this work, uh, not as little individual organizations uh, uh, operating at a small scale, but start to build an idea of the, the reach and the scope of the work that is happening in Africa. So um, I, I, I absolutely appreciate the point that you're making, Peter, that, that the AP work is, um, in a sense, it's very well branded. And so it comes across as something that's really um, ad being adopted and penetrating across Andhra Pradesh very, very substantially. Um, so that's, that's also some of the work that we're trying to, to, to look at as well. John, you had a question. Uh, well, it was more, more a comment. I think, yeah, I think it's, it's true to say that it's very different and we have very different situations here. So the application of the natural farming principles has to apply in each situation. Uh, but for me, the, the, the main value of the link with Andrew Pradesh is, is to, for us to challenge ourselves around scaling up. Uh, if you went there 20 years ago, I think you would probably see something like what we've got here. You've got various activities going on, uh, NGOs doing stuff, various things. So they, they, it wasn't so long ago that it was like that. And now they've managed to find the opening. They've managed to, in the case of Andhra Pradesh, it was the, the suicide rates and the willingness of, of the Andhra Pradesh government to take this on because of those suicide rates was one of the main driving. Also the fact that they've done a lot of the work with self-help groups, women's self. So, so the conditions were there. And I think the challenge for us is to find those strategic openings where we can scale up this kind of work. And I have a feeling that uh, linking to Jessica's presentation on the in input support uh, programs, I have a feeling that that could be an area where we identify a district in Malawi in a county in Kenya or wherever a district in Zimbabwe, where there's already a potential, where there's already things going on, where there's already government officials interested. Uh, and we look at, a, at designing a scaling up at that district level and an alternative to that input support program. It could be support to set up production of biostimulants or something that's done very carefully so it doesn't create dependency. But I think an alternative, because those input support programs cost government an absolute fortune. And that's another thing in, in Andhra Pradesh is that they are showing in their program that they're saving government uh, billions of rupees because the government's no longer having to 
to subsidize fertilizers which they were doing it there. So I think that that's our, our big challenge is, is to keep thinking, how do we take this brilliant work that's going on and how do we scale up? Thanks, John. Um, before I come to you, Paul, I just I wanted to just um, uh, oh, sorry I wanted to make uh, to answer Peter's question about um, uh, uh, arid applications of this. So I'm going to just share my screen. Um, this is a um, something that was sent through from VJ uh, to John I think this morning or yesterday. And don't don't get lost in the numbers, but um, it's. It's looking at the application of this, these principles, particularly with uh, PMDS uh, in, I just wanted to, to point out the temperatures, the soil temperatures uh, and the atmospheric temperatures. So um, uh, this is, this is uh, being uh, recorded uh, here, this temp temperature is at 40, five degrees and the soil temperature is at 38 in the control field and they're finding in the PMDS field there's a difference of temperature of 10 degrees uh, in the soil temperature which is pretty substantial. So I, I don't want to get lost in all the figures there but I just wanted to point out that um, there are figures coming in for this approach that are applicable to hot very hot dry land climate, as well as the subtropical and equatorial examples that we've been looking at. Um, Paul, you've had your hand up for a while. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, again, to thank the um, presenters, uh, very, very well done. And um, also, I agree with all the, the comments made it's by Peter and John there. Uh, our situation here in Zambia is also quite different than. Uh, the, than the 2,000 millimeters per year. We, we only get between sometimes now the 500 up to 700 and within three months, roughly. Uh, two two uh, comments I wanted to make were um, the, the way they do the seed coating, I, you know, I understand that the, the principle the, the for seed coating, uh, what I understand is that the, the, um, the, the reason for doing it is to uh, enhance the biology, um, but I'm just wondering whether we can do it some some different way because um, I, I doubt that we will be able to, to uh, coat each seed separately here in, in Zambia. I don't know that farmers will 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 take that on. And I'm just wondering if there's some other way we could we could be looking at that. You know, I see I see the value of it, but I, is there some other way we could do it? And then the, this, the second point is has to do with the uh, the culture and the faith in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, there's more or less one faith and the culture is, is very similar. And uh, I think I did ask Vijay that uh, uh, a few sessions back. And then when the people go to the field, they, they take a moment to um, to offer a prayer. And I think that, you know, that's, that's all part of, of, of the uh, of the uptake. Uh, whereas uh, here we, we could have, uh, you know, it's, it's, it would be different again. So I just wanted to make those two comments, uh, Matt. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. That's, uh, it's good to have these, the, the comments feeding in at this stage. And I, I realize we're running out of time. I'm going to go quickly on to uh, Sam uh, for a quick question. I'll try and take Esther in as well before we finish. But I wanted to also introduce uh, Charles, who will be um, uh, acting as a um, holding this particular initiative together before we finish. So, um, Sam, go ahead. Yeah, I think I have two issues. First of all, the issue of how do we scale out as far as numbers are concerned. You see, we have several uh, organizations which are hungry for, for, for this knowledge. And, and once we really, we uh, who have started this movement of uh, natural farming, if we could really get those people and give that knowledge to the hungry organization, to the hungry farmers, to the hungry people, you are going to see that this knowledge is going to spread like a, a bushfire. So I think we should not be worried about 
the, the actual the numbers, but what we should do is really identify those people who are struggling, but they don't have the answers, which we already have. Okay, the thinking, which we already have. For example, as, as, as for what we have seen actually, the 365 green cover really is, is working. Looking at the software retail, looking at the pest management, but also some people are asking, even ourselves, how do we really achieve that? I find out that I, if we think that every day is a planting day, you plant every day, you plant every day, you let the seed grow. I think we are going to achieve the 365 and then try to, to give value to each crop which you grow. I, I think that one will help us to achieve that 365 uh, degrees green cover. So I, I think that's what I wanted to actually say. Thanks, Sam. Fantastic. Thank you. And Esther, one last quick question. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to share my experience, which is something I think you all need to know. The seed cotton is very useful in protecting the seed from pests and insects in the soil. We have tried seed cotton, especially for maize and beans and the bigger grains with molasses and um, quarry dust and uh, wood ash. And it has protected even from squirrels, from rats, and it stays in the soil for a long time, especially in dry lands without being affected before it grows. The other thing that it does is that the coating has the basic phosphate and the nutrients so that when it rains, the crops grow very strong rooting systems. They shoot very well and they grow faster than if you planted them without dressing the seed. And it's something we are promoting in the schools where we are working in the prisons and in the community and people are really embracing it. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Esther. And it's great to have a, 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 um, a, a real, somebody shouting out and championing seed coating because it does look incredibly difficult. And it's just a question of trying to find the right practical way of applying a coating at whatever scale you're working at, whether it's working with uh, a, a, a hand cloth or whether it's working with a rotating drum or whatever. Um, I, I think we're coming to the end of the call. I wanted to just um, introduce uh, Charles to whom we um, and uh, he, we've actually um, found some funding to have somebody hold this project uh, as a member of staff for, uh, within AFSA um, and um, so Hopefully, um, it's a it's a sign of our intention to to really um, establish this work going forward, and it's really really exciting to have Charles on board. So, Charles, I don't know whether you wanted to just um, come off mute and introduce yourself very briefly. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Charles Wanga Mohe. I am the new health soil health seafood project officer. I joined. Uh, past February 2022. I come from the uh, mid western part of Uganda. And I was formerly uh, working with the university uh, and uh, were helping students understand agroecology, doing some research, uh, also supporting teaching, but also uh, supporting community outreach programs. I'm very happy to be uh, with you, and I'm very happy to join the AFSA Secretariat team and the soil, Healthy Soil uh, Healthy Food uh, Initiative. Thank you very much. Thanks, Charles. So I would just um, like to once again thank all the, the people who are doing the presentations. They're very, very good quality and very informative. Thanks for the questions. Um, I would really encourage people who feel that we haven't quite answered their questions to contact organizations directly. Um, you all know how to get in touch with each other. And the more of that information flowing uh, is the more the better. The, uh, the next, um, uh, I'm just trying to find the date of the next meeting. Um, it is the February the 24th. Uh, where we'll have another three presentations. So that's a note for your diary. 
Uh, and apart from that, I think thanks to John to, for the, doing a lot of the backup and the organization and the administration. Uh, and thanks to everybody here. And see you next time around. <laughs>